Please think about just these words of all that you just heard. The words that Jesus says to that man who is worried about his child. Do not fear, but only believe. This morning, the readings from Mark's Gospel, boy, that is one of our all-time favorite stories from the Gospels, huh? We always hear those two stories together, these stories of healing, one tucked inside the other. We've all heard this dramatic story retold so many times. We know that we're never ever meant to hear just one of those stories without the other. We're meant to understand that they are related and that not just the stories, but the relationship between them is meant to tell us something about who Jesus is, but more than that, about our faith and about our work as disciples. Probably you remember some of those connections from sermons you've heard before about those stories. Both of the people who get healed are women, but the women are different. One is a full-grown woman and the other is a young girl. The woman has been afflicted for 12 years by an illness that no one can heal. And that illness meant that she was absolutely outcast from her society. She is seen as something unclean and dangerous and frankly, disgusting. She is the lowest of the low. She is poor and marginalized. The girl has been alive for exactly as long as the woman has suffered, 12 years. But her father, is a leader of the synagogue. In the world around Jesus, she is of the upper class, at least among the Jewish people. The woman is in a class of discarded people. Now in our own generation, as we've become more sensitive to questions of economic and social justice, whenever we preach about this story, we emphasize the order in which things happen. The rich little girl we learn about first, but it is the poor woman who gets healed first. He's never even introduced to that woman, Jesus. She is last in social importance, but first to be touched by the Lord. In fact, the subtext of the story suggests to us that the people in Jairus' household, they think that little girl has died because Jesus has been delayed by that outcast woman. That's never said outright in the story, but the reaction of those people, we sort of get that tone. Why trouble him anymore? Your daughter is already dead. Well, we know all these things, but I wonder, I wonder whether we might be missing something if we might be a little bit misled by what seems to be obvious, we have always thought about these stories as stories about healing. But what if that's really just an incidental part of what's going on here? What if the real point of these stories is about something else, not about Jesus' power, but about our purpose? I've just finished my first week in Rome. And in the past week, I've met a great many people, some of whom are very interesting. I've met a lot of people for the very first time, but one of them, one of those people, taught me something especially deep about the lesson we just heard. He is a neighbor of ours, as it turns out. And because of the chance I had of meeting him, I saw something new about the truth of these stories. It was Thursday of this past week, and we had been invited to a very elegant luncheon at the Anglican Center, which some of you know. We went, and it was one of those lunches where you meet all of the people you're supposed to know, and so we went around shaking hands, and when it was all over, it was one of those lunches that you need to walk off. And so we walked all the way back to the church. And as I approached the door here, I saw a young man hovering by the door and obviously wanting to get inside. 
And as I approached him, it turned out that he was from the St. George's International School, and he was here to make some connection with the refugee center. So I got out my key to open the door and let him in. And just as I did, that door burst open. And inside was a man whom I did not recognize. And he looked right at me and said, there is a woman dying. Can you help her? I was a little disoriented. And so I said to him, is she here? I thought maybe she was in the refugee center. No, no, he said, she's on the street. Please, please come. So I followed him. He led me down the Via Napoli on the way down to the Via del Viminale. And there almost to the corner across the street, lying in a doorway in the shade, was an emaciated woman alone. By her head, there was a bottle of Coca-Cola and a bottle of water. I later found out that this man had bought the water for her. Her breathing was labored, she was dressed in rags, and her body was covered in sores. That man looked at me and said, she said she doesn't want the medico. But his eyes said to me, what should we do? I asked if he knew her name. He'd already asked her name. Her name was Sara. And finally, I looked at him and said, I think we have to call the ambulanza. He hesitated, but he pulled out his phone and he called them. And I could tell from what he said to them that he had already called them before, just asking for advice about what to do. And then do you know what he had done? He came here looking for help. He came to our church looking for someone to help. All he got was me. I wasn't much help. My Italian, as you already know, is very poor. All I did was encourage him to do the thing he already wanted to do, which was to call for the ambulance. Well, he looked at me and said, they said they'd be here in four minutes. So I asked him, are you, do you work at the church? <laughs> I'd never seen him before. No, no, he said, I work at the opera. He had been coming to the grocery store to get some lunch, and he saw this suffering woman lying in the street. So he ran and got her a bottle of water, and then he came here. His name is Andrea. He used to be a singer. Now he works in the office at the opera. I learned all of that as we chatted. And then he got impatient because the ambulance hadn't come, and he called them again. We could hear the siren circling us, but they couldn't find us. And finally, just as he was about to hang up, we saw that ambulance turn the corner here. And Andrea ran out into the street, waving madly to get their attention. Well, the end of the story is that those ambulance attendants took care of Sara. They put a cold compress on her head, they gathered up her things, and she went with them in the ambulance to the hospital. When all that was over, Andrea and I said goodbye, and we each went off to the rest of our days. So now why have I told you this story? Maybe the two stories we heard from Mark's Gospel aren't really about healing. 
Maybe the two people in the story who are most alike are not the woman and the girl. Just maybe we're meant to see something in common between that woman and Jesus. Here's what I mean. The woman in the story is sure of two things. She is sure that God loves her, even though everyone around her is telling her otherwise. And she believes that she can act in such a way as to make God's love real in her life. A force so powerful that it can heal her. That is what she believes. And it turns out that is exactly what Jesus believes. We know this because of what he tells that woman. He doesn't want to find her in all of that crowd to call her out on touching his garment. He wants to find her because he knows that she is a woman who sees the same truth that he does. That everyone is a child beloved of God. They both know, Jesus and this woman, that God is love. And they both act on that faith. Jairus, that girl's father, he wants to believe. But in the end, his faith is overwhelmed by his fear. He is still paralyzed by that question. What should we do? What should any of us do? Do not fear. Only believe. That's what Jesus says to that man. And when he says those words, he is describing to him exactly what that woman had already known. Her fear was overpowered by her faith, and she acted. That's a story from a long time ago. My new friend Andrea made it real for me on Thursday. All of us know what it is like to see another human being suffering and bereft. All of us know that, and all of us know what it is like to feel a little bit afraid, a little bit disgusted, a little bit too, too fearful of doing something, but not our neighbor. Yes, he was hesitant, but his compassion overcame his fear. He tried to help immediately. When he got stuck, he came here looking for help. And in the end, he acted. Because for reasons best known to him, he believed that lying in front of him was a child of God, a fellow human being, and that the love who is God wanted him to act for her. I met a lot of people this week. But out of all the people I met, our neighbor Andrea gave me the most powerful example of what it looks like to be a disciple in this world. I don't know what he believes. I don't know what church he goes to or if he goes to church. I don't know anything about him other than what I saw. But I know that Christ does not ask us what we believe. Christ asks us what we do for those whom God loves, just as God loves us. I know that just like our neighbor Andrea, people come to us expecting that they will find here people prepared to act in love, even when we are afraid. And I hope that whenever the choice faces any of us, we will remember that example and reach out of our fear into compassion toward the love we know has the power to heal and to change and to save. Amen.